everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar. This is Adam Keyes. I'm a product manager at TestOut. Um, and before I introduce our, our speaker today, just a couple administrative items. Um, the recording of this webinar will be sent out to all of you, as well as those who have not been able to attend. Um, at the very end of the webinar, after a question and answer period, we will also have a survey that pops right up on your screen in a browser after you close out the webinar. Seven quick questions. Just wanted to ask a little bit about your cybersecurity program and uh, this webinar, as it is a new, a new type of webinar for us. And uh, we will also have a question and answer at the end of, of Spencer's portion. Um, there is in the GoToWebinar tab that's on your screen on the taskbar, there is a section that says questions. So please enter any questions you have there throughout the presentation. Um, for those that are individual questions, I'll respond to you directly. And for those that will benefit the entire audience, I'll save those towards the end. But please enter those questions as you have them. So today we're going to be, we, we recently had a uh, educator conference. Um, for test out. And one of the major questions that came up a few times listening into different instructors was building out a cybersecurity program and uh, the the pitfalls and the stumbling. And, and I thought this would be a great topic. And while at this conference, I, I was um, pleased to have a conversation with Spencer DeGraw. He's the cybersecurity chair at LDS Business College. And he seems to have gone through the whole process from from nothing to a comprehensive cybersecurity program at LDS Business College, and uh, has done so in just a, in just under six years. So, I thought he would be a great person to walk through um, what he was able to experience, an ideal scenario of what you want a cybersecurity to pro program to look like. And uh, with that being said, I'd just like to turn it over to Spencer, and uh, happy to have him here with us. Great, thank you, Adam. So um, I thought it would make sense maybe to just give a little bit of a, a background on myself and on the the college here, just to kind of uh, help you see the the um, the battle that I had to fight to get things going here. We're a little um, two year school here in downtown Salt Lake City. Um, when I started here, I just started as an adjunct, um, teaching a couple of IT classes, and that was it. Uh, our, our name is, a, is, is LDS Business College, so most of the, most of the focus here at the college is, is uh, in the traditional business uh, uh, concepts, the, the, the accounting and the finance. And so IT was really kind of an afterthought here. And um, after teaching a couple semesters here, I started having some some kind of blunt conversations with some of the folks here about the importance of IT. And uh, you know, you can't really have a business without IT nowadays. So you can't really have a business college without uh, an IT program as well. And uh, fortunately, the, the the you know senior executives at the college understood what I was saying and, and gave me a chance to kind of. Uh, build things out. The problem, of course, was, uh, as many of you probably experienced, um, I had no budget and nobody to help me. So it was pretty much just me. Um, by way of my personal background, I did come out of the cybersecurity world. So I'm not really, uh, I, I don't consider myself an academic. I consider myself a, a, a high tech uh, professional who's now dabbling in academia, I suppose. Um, I did come out of uh, way back when I started in networking, kind of evolved into the cybersecurity world. So I do have some background in cybersecurity, um, but and, and so that that did help. Um, again, I meant, as I mentioned, I started here just um, as an adjunct, but they did finally bring me on as the only full-time IT instructor. So the program that I built was not just a cyber. Uh, initially, I had to build the IT program, and then once I had that built up, I was able to kind of pivot, uh, and now uh, I'm just focused on the cyber. We've got now um, a couple of other full-time people that we've gotten here over the past few years, and so I've been able to kind of push some of the uh, the, the traditional IT courses and, and stuff to them so I can just focus on building up the cyber, the cyber program here, but uh, again, just to kind of hopefully set a context here that I, I did start with nothing. I had no budget. I still don't have much budget. Um, all of the hardware that I have uh, has been donated. 
Um, the school will provide some basic things, um, but uh, most of the hardware, you know, computers and, and workstations I have have all been donated. So uh, that was, uh, and that actually turned out to be a lot easier than I thought, which I'll get into a little bit later. My kind of my philosophy and strategy in all of this as I've been building it up um, was just this idea that, you know, that this idea that if I build it, they will come. I didn't, I didn't fully, I didn't fully trust that. I, I, I loved the movie, but I, I didn't know if that was going to be realistic in, uh, in real life. So I kind of took the approach of I was going to build it first and kind of prototype things and see if I could get things working before I even went upstairs and try to get it all approved. So I, I, I kind of have a slight variation on that saying that success breeds approval. Uh, a lot of the approvals that I've been able to get lately have only come because I've already kind of been doing it. Um, so I, I suppose it's a slight variation on the easier to get uh, forgiveness than permission model. But that's kind of how I've uh, how I've kind of approached that. Um, so just uh, as kind of a, a, a context, um, here's the common obstacles that I'm going to assume. I, I'm not sure exactly who all is on the call with us. Um, I'm going to assume we've got some uh, small schools, uh, university college schools. I've, I'm going to assume we've also probably got some high school uh, folks on, on here as well. But I'm pretty sure most of us pr probably have some commonalities, common experiences where, you know, we have no hardware. We may or may not have any cyber experience. Uh, I, I really was a department of one for a long time, and so I had to figure out how I could scale myself. Uh, the first thing I had to figure out was what classes was I even going to teach. So the, these were kind of where where I had to start. Um, as I'm building these classes, and again, not coming out of academia, I also had to learn some of the basics of how to you know how to assess things and and how to build rubrics and that kind of a thing. Um, and so that that's one of the the obstacles that I had to initially deal with. Uh, that was actually where I um, first kind of came across test out and and some of the stuff that the test out technologies were able to do was provide a lot of that for me. Um, and then of course uh, in the long run I had to justify any new costs. Uh, so uh, that was really where I where I started. And I have to think most of you are probably feeling uh, like you're in about the same the same spot. Um, so here were my objectives. I really kind of had two primary objectives, and both of them focused on the students. Uh, the whole point of college, of course, needs to be, or any education, is to uh, you know better somebody's life, uh, better equip somebody with with more skills or more knowledge or more understanding. And so I kind of, as I as I started by identifying what <clears throat> what um, what was going to be of most value to the students i had to i had to always kind of keep in mind that whatever we were going to teach here if it didn't lead to some beginner job uh then what was the point i i i i probably shouldn't be spending my 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 time and effort on it. and again we're a two year school so you know i don't i don't have the luxury of having four years to teach these students i have to i have to get them in and out and get them working uh, i have a lot of my students who are mid career folks uh, you know, some of them have already got uh, bachelor's degrees, and some even have master's degrees. They just don't have any technology experience. So, so I needed to make it, uh, you know, as as beefy as possible to get them a, a solid foundation, and then uh, and then get them out working. So, so as I was designing and defi defining what classes I was going to build, that was kind of my first objective. Is I needed to figure out what were the easy starter jobs that someone coming right out of a two-year school could get. And so that was uh, kind of where I started there. Uh, in the cyber world, now in, in the IT world in general, of course, that's always going to be a tech support job. Those are, you know, there, there's a billion of them out there. They're all over the place. Uh, so, but they, they have to have a basic IT foundation. In the cyber world, uh, what I'm find is the probably the most common starter job, beginner job, is going to probably be some sort of a security analyst um, working in a SOC somewhere, a security operations center. Um, and, you know, they're doing some basic uh, packet analysis and, and traffic analysis stuff. So we'll get into a little bit of that later. But this to just kind of give you a point of reference, this was where I was starting as I'm trying to figure out how can I get these cyber students into these beginner cyber jobs, uh, 
specifically uh, a security analyst was, was is my primary focus. My uh, second objective was to provide an opportunity uh, for the, the my students to put stuff on their resume. So everything I'm doing here, all the classes are, are a majority of my classes um, end with some sort of an industry certification. I, I have to assume many of you are already are doing some of that with the with the uh, with the CompTIA certs uh, and uh, and of course the test out certifications uh, are in that same league. And so we of course have, have kind of hitched our wagon to the test out certifications. Uh, I personally am, am more of a fan of the, you know, there, there's two kind of exams. Do I know how to answer a multiple choice question or can I actually do a task and complete a task? You know, can I actually configure a server or set up a, uh, a, a system somehow? So the, the, the test out, certification exams personally I think are the the better type of a certification even though they're not as popular uh, and have not been around as long as the CompTIA exams. So the fact that I can use the test out certifications as our final exam was another key part of uh, building out these classes. So again with the student focus as, as, as my top priority number one am I preparing them for jobs and number two am I helping them build their resume with certifications. So those were my two primary objectives when I started out. Um, and, as, and, and I will also address as we go along here how I, as part of building up this program, I've, I've tried to build out kind of my own little lab so that I have an, uh, an excuse to hire some of my better students in this lab in some sort of an internship uh, position so that they can also add that to their, to their resume. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned before, if, if the primary job in a cyber or the, or the most common entry job in a cyber for a cyber student is going to be uh, some sort of a security analyst, they do need to understand packet captures and, and packet analysis. And so what I hope to convey today is even if you don't know much about this, uh, at least now you know kind of what you're shooting for. And there's a there's a couple of really easy tools that I'll show you here in a minute that you can kind of uh, build into your programs that are wonderful tools. There's a lot of resources out there available so that you can build all sorts of fun projects and labs uh, around them. Uh, the the one primarily that I'll show you is Wireshark. It's been around for a hundred years. Uh, any every network engineer on the planet probably has already got it installed on their laptop or at least knows about it and has used it a few times. So so Wireshark will be a key part of this. Uh, but again, focusing on what that starter job is as a security analyst. So the first thing that um, I had to kind of figure out was what were my available resources. Um, I did not, you know, my background was pretty specific. I was 20 years out doing doing a, a lot of this stuff in networking and in cyber, but that was very very specific. And so some of the broader stuff I was a little weaker on, and so I had to kind of uh, supplement my my own personal skill set with. Uh, with other resources. And so the first thing, again, that was one of the first time, uh, reasons I ran into test out uh, is just because of all the content that they provided. Um, I didn't have the time nor the ability or really even the, the depth of knowledge in a lot of some of the, st the broader uh, stuff uh, to provide all the lectures and all the content and stuff. So, so having it kind of all pre-built for me just made it very easy to, uh, to kind of supplement what I was trying to do. So using this idea of a flipped classroom, I was able to um, do all of the, you know, so all of the, what we, what we would traditionally call less lectures in the classroom, I kind of pushed that off on a test out. So with all the videos and all the, the you know, videos that they've got in their content, uh, the students in our program, they're supposed to have already watched all the videos uh, before they come to class. Now, realistically, many of them don't do that, but uh, each week they know what videos they're supposed to be watching. So they can get all the lectures without me having to actually deliver all the lectures. And so it, it allows me to focus on uh, just the labs and stuff that we're gonna do uh, when we're actually in class. So by using these this content provider like TestOut, it's allowed me to really flip the classroom up, upside down. And so the students have to do all the labs and all the watch all the videos and they do all that on their own time. That's their homework. So all we're doing in class is just playing. And, you know, I mean, I will have some conversations and to try to maybe help explain some things that maybe they're not understanding. 
But once we get through the discussion part of it, then it's pretty much all right, everybody fire up your laptops and let's start playing. Um, it was huge for us to uh, build uh, some virtualization capabilities. Um, so we use uh, here, um, we use uh, VMware. And um, I've, I've kind of got some references on online there. Some of you may already be aware of this and may already be using it, but they've got a pretty good education licensing program through Cavuto um, that um, I just buy a departmental license. Um, I can, you know, it does have to come out of my budget and I have been able to finally scrape up this much money a year to pay for it. But 150 bucks a year uh, is about what I think I'm paying now. And um, that gives me access to all the VMware software so then the students can download it and install it on, on their machines. And, and then of course we're running it, I'll, I'll explain in a minute how we're running it, uh, some of it in our, in our little student lab area as well. But that's, you know, for 150 bucks a year, that certainly was, was, uh, was uh, doable. And uh, I was able to justify that. So I do, have, I do have that into my budget. Some other resources that I will reference uh, throughout the rest of the conversation here, I've listed there on the right. Uh, uh, there, you know, so much of what we do in cyber is really just playing one big game. I tell the I tell, tell the kids all the time that you know a, a career in cybersecurity is the closest you'll come to being a gamer and getting paid very well for it, because your entire career is built around good guys and bad guys and 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 you know. You're you're trying to stop the bad guy and and all these different ways of of doing that, and it's just one big game, which also makes it really fun to teach because if you design your programs right and your classes right, uh, a lot of it can be built around just playing some of these fun games. Uh, the first thing that I have found uh, was the National Cyber League, and that's you know thirty five dollars per student. I do make the students pay for this, so I do consider this a a, a class fee. Initially, when we used this, uh, I made it part of one of my classes. I have since backed off of that, and I'm running this more through our, our school cyber club. So I'm not actually using this as a class anymore. I did I did start out doing that initially, uh, but then I've, I, I got doing some other things, so I decided to push this uh, out of the class and make this more of a an optional thing. But this has been a lot of fun because uh, it's, it, you know, one of the other things that I, I felt very strongly about was to build a, a club that we could run here at the school, uh, but none of the kids knew what to do and, you know, what to talk about each time they got together. And I didn't have the time to prepare anything because uh, I want the students to run the club. So I basically just pointed them to this and said, why don't you guys just sign up for the Cyber League each semester? And uh, they've, you know, they've been doing that and uh, they're having a lot of fun with it. So they get together because some of the, some, you know, it's just one big, it's one big game that they're playing. And uh, for 35 bucks a semester or for a season, um, they, they're, they're having a lot of fun with it. So that's, that's one of the resources. Uh, there are cyber patriot competitions that are out there. Cyber patriots is a, is a big thing run by the, it was started by the U.S. Air Force. I think they still, I think they still sponsor it. Um, and the, the U.S. Cyber Range Labs is another uh, another place I have found. I've not I've not used that one myself, uh, but from what I'm looking from what I've seen of it, it looks like another real promising thing. Um, it does have a monthly fee I did identify, but there's a bunch of these types of things, and so a lot of what you can do in classes is just preparing for the next competition. Uh, again, I've decided to use that through our club, so anybody that's in a member of our club. Uh, they are the ones that we you know, we pick that we pick the the the, the comp competition teams from anybody that's on the club. So that's how we've we've used these competitions. We go to a lot of these uh, collegiate cyber competitions that they have around the area here in uh, again we're in the we're in the Rocky Mountain region. So we go to um, uh, there's a Rocky Mountain uh, collegiate defense competition every year in Denver. We take a team over to. Um, so we we've had a lot of fun with these competitions. And uh, the students just love it, and uh, they're not very expensive. And um, you know, most of them we can drive to. The one in Denver, we do have to. We, that one, that one's more expensive because we have to, you know, go to get a hotel and, and get over there. But anyway, um, these are just some resources that are out there. There are plenty of others, but these are the the key ones that I thought I would at least list here today. Um, the two primary tools that I use. Throughout my courses, in, in addition to the test out stuff, we do use a lot of the test out stuff. We are already signed up to use their new ethical hacker class. I think we're one of the first ones probably to sign up for it. 
Um, but I've been talking with them a lot. I knew it was coming. So I've been kind of waiting for it to be released. And now that it's out, we've already plugged it into our LMS and we're ready to use it this fall. Uh, but these are the two uh, uh, open source tools that we use a lot. And we, we try to be kind of a little bit uh, repetitive in, in our classes. So we don't just use Wireshark in one class. We use it in uh, you know, two and three uh, classes uh, so that they're getting some really good exposure with it. It's just a free tool at Wireshark.org. Any student can download it and install it. Um, I think they've even got a Mac version. I know some of our students have Macs. Cali.org is, uh, is the big one we get into when we get into the real cyber intensive classes. Uh, Cali is just, a, just an open source tool out there that's got a whole bunch of things out there. And in one class, we, we kind of just spend the time just exploring the different tools of Cali. So, you know, uh, I'll get into a little bit more of that later. But these are all resources that are out there. They, they don't cost any money. Um, so that's, that, that's very helpful as well. So um, I, I've got a, the next uh, few slides just to kind of throw some little, you know, different what if scenarios. So what are my options if I don't know much about cyber? So again, the real value for me, for me by using a, a, a content provider like Testout is you don't really have to know that much, at least not initially, because you don't have to provide the lectures, you don't have to provide the labs. You, you know, it's all it, it all can be done right through the the uh, the portal. And the students can can kind of do that uh, on their own time. Now, if you're brand new to it, then you might want to use the time during class to go through some of the test out labs. So, so I know there are some schools that are doing that as part of their in class experience as well. Um, and especially if you're just starting out, that's certainly certainly doable. You will find over time as you get more and more comfortable with what you're supposed to know that you can kind of again push that off to the homework. And it frees you up to uh, to do more of your own little in-class projects, which is where uh, that's where the classes really get fun is when the kids are working together on sol on solving some some problem. Um, it, it also makes you more of a fa facilitator rather than having to just be the lecturer. So so I have found, um, in fact, in a lot of places still, I find, you know, uh, I don't know all the details stuff. So I, I'm kind of learning it as, as I go as well with the students. Um, and so we're just kind of all learning it together. Uh, what are my options if I'm a department of one? Well, again, test out has been extremely helpful there. Uh, there are other resources out there and I've explored several of the other ones. Um, in a couple of classes I'm using stuff because test out either doesn't have a class or, or, I, or I'm not, you know, what they're providing is not quite uh, what, I, what I need. But, uh, but by using a content provider like that, it makes it scalable. One of the things that um, I have been able to do uh, in a couple of cases is by having all of the homework done uh, on the student's own time, I can scale my own self a little bit better because I can have one big lab class where I might have students come in from, you know, maybe my network class and my server class, but I have one joint lab together where they're all kind of working on projects together. So that way, even though I've got two separate classes, one focused on the server pro content once focus on the network pro content i can have kind of a combined lab so again i'm scaling myself a little bit easier that way um by mixing you know the 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 test out content that they're learning on their own time with what we're doing in the in the lab uh another question uh what are what are my options if i don't have my own lab environment this of course was a big problem for me early on i did have a classroom uh, that had some hardware in it so I, I was fortunate, at least to enough, to have inherited uh, uh, that. But it was it was limited in what it could do. They were just desktops, um, and the students were sharing them. And invariably, I'd get one student that would click the wrong button, and he'd reformat the whole machine, and it was it was really kind of a pain. Um, and so uh, the first thing I had looked at was trying to kind of build a virtual lab through either Azure or AWS. Um, I didn't end up having to need this uh, because I was able to get uh, uh, several servers donated through some uh, some you know door knocking that I did initially. But that was going to be my my initial plan was to just you know uh, see if I could at least justify some bu enough budget for AWS or for Azure, one of those online uh, you know virtual environments, so that I could ha at least have an environment where the students could log in and create their own virtual machines. Uh, it just seemed to, to make sense to me to to, to uh, 
to let the kids uh, play in the in the virtual world. Uh, in addition to the fact that it's easier for me and it scales me a little bit better. Uh, obviously, most of you already know in the IT world nowadays, most of it is virtual anyway. So the students need exposure to the virtualized world anyway. So this just was an excuse to to, to do that. Um, as I did mention, I was able to get um, some hardware donated, so I started building kind of my own virtual lab as well. Um, and then uh, initially, I didn't uh, I didn't feel comfortable requiring a laptop for my students. We have a lot of international kids here, and a lot of them are you know were, spend all the, the 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 little bit money they had. They spend it all just to get here to the U.S. and and to get into school. So requiring a laptop was was not something I felt really comfortable with initially. Um, and so by building out a virtual back end or, you know, kind of a, a cloud, basically we built, I built my own little cloud here on campus. So um, I had a little bit more control of it. And uh, so then all the, all the students really needed was some, was just a browser. They just needed a browser and then they could connect to the VM uh, in my cloud in environment. So that's kind of where I started was just, I think I had three or four pretty beefy servers on the back end, each running VMware's ESXi technology. And then um, I could just build some VMs on top of that. What this eventually evolved into, just as a side note, was it also then gave me an excuse to start hiring some of my own students to now run this cloud environment for me. So now I've gotten to a point where um, again, success breeds approval. Um, I was able to show my my executive team what I had built here with basically donated hardware and the VMware software licenses that I had purchased were were fairly in, you know, relatively inexpensive because I, they were education licenses. So by having it already built and being able to demo how I'm already using it, when I went to the to the executive team and said, "Look, I, I want budget to be able to pay." Some students, you know, I mean, I don't pay them all that great, but I, but at least I can pay them something, and it, and they, and you know, again, it's resume material for them to say, look, I, I built and manage a VMware environment, cloud environment for the college. It all, it just kind of, it's, it's, it's a win-win all the way around. So, that's kind of where I started, and as, as I've gotten now, you know, years later. I keep getting more hardware donated. Uh, local businesses are finding out what we're doing here, and they're throwing—they're actually th throwing hardware at us. So, I'm actually at a point where I'm starting to turn away hardware. So it's—it's it's kind of—it's kind of nice. But I have not—I have not bought one desktop or one server uh, on my own here. So um, it just took a little uh, footwork up front to go out and start asking uh, asking some of the local businesses. Um, what are my options if I want to use VMs in the classroom? Again, I've kind of explained that the, the primary uh, infrastructure that I'm running on is ESXi from VMware. I do pay for the educational license out of my de as part of my departmental budget, um, but it's it's not that much, and um, you know we just have to uh, the, the, the students just have to rebuild the licenses and rebuild the machines uh, from time to time as they're going through that. So. It's uh, it's worked out really well. So virtualization really is the way to go. Uh, it, it, uh, it just makes it a lot easier. Plus, if they break a machine, they don't really break a machine. You just delete it and you reinstall it. So it's pretty slick. Um, some of the obstacles, again, some of this is a little repetitive. Cost of the hardware. Um, I have not bought any uh, of the machines myself. I have bought a I, uh, I have bought a couple of switches. And I think I bought two routers, but both all of them were used and all of them off of Amazon and all of the switches were under a hundred bucks. And I think the routers cost a couple hundred dollars, but I saved up and I and I got those. Um, and uh, I have been able to get most of my routers and switches donated, but I did need some extra switches for my one networking class. And so I was able to get on Amazon and I found some for under a hundred bucks. So. Anyway, it, it is possible to do. Um, my initial problem was an executive team that had no, I mean, they couldn't even spell IT. So um, I had to convince them, first of all, just the just the importance of it. Um, it wasn't a hard sell. Honestly, most of them intuitively knew it, but they just didn't have any clue or point of reference on how to how to build it. So when I offered to just build it, they, they pretty much just kind of said, great, just let us know, you know, if you need something, uh, except money. Of course, they didn't want to give me any money. 
there is uh, some, some legal issues that you probably want to consider. Um, where we run everything in our own sandbox, it's not really a major problem for us. Uh, we do, however, make a very big deal at the beginning of our cyber classes, uh, this idea that you know, the only difference between a hacker, uh, who is a person that may or may not yet have a felony, uh, and a pen tester, who is a person who uh, may or may not yet be at six-figure income, the only difference between those two people is permission. And so it gives us an excuse to really pound the idea of getting approval and getting contracts in place. So in our uh, 200 level classes, our upper level classes, uh, all of our cyber classes begin with the student signing basically an, end, an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, and uh, some other legal looking paper that, I don't know if it's actually legal because it doesn't really hold them to anything, but it, the idea of just making sure they understand, you know, you do anything outside of of our lab and you're on your own. If you get arrested for something, we're not, you know, we're not liable because you signed this document. So anyway, that uh, really gives us a chance to kind of uh, impress upon them the, the, the importance of understanding that when we're dealing with cybersecurity stuff, you don't have permission to just go hack anybody. So that's why I can set up just some, I set up some real vulnerable servers in our lab and I just let them hack the you know the the heck out of that, but that's uh, that's all they have to do. But anyway, so just just be aware uh, of of those kinds of things. You may want to talk to your school, uh, you know, see if they have any uh, policy in place that you need to be aware of. Um, all right, so let me just give you kind of a couple of sample projects. Um, I've been talking a lot about how we we pre we don't really spend a lot of time in our classroom going through the test out stuff, that's pretty much just on their own. We, we'll, we'll fire it up a, a few times, but for the most part, they do all that stuff on their own time. So what we do in class are just actual projects. And here's, here's some examples of some of the labs that I've had them do. This particular site is primarily focused on traffic analysis. And they've got uh, years worth, they started uh, back in, I think, 2013, 2012 or 2013, and the, whoever's running this has just been building a whole bunch of, of data sets of different uh, PCAP files and data sets that you can pull down and have the students analyze. They, they provide the, the, uh, you know, the grading key and everything for it. So I've built several of these labs into my courses uh, just to give them some practical experiences. And so uh, I'll have the students do some of these labs, and then we'll spend some time in class where they'll, they'll kind of you know, like some of the kids will do one one of the labs and another group will do another lab and another group will do another lab. And then one day we'll spend each one, each of the groups teaching the other groups about what they did and what they learned and, and stuff like that. So it gives them a chance to kind of teach one another and and uh, and share their experiences with each other. But this site here is a fantastic site with a lot of a lot of good content. Um, another basic one is just your basic NMAP scan. A lot of you may already be doing this. It's a, it should be, we do this in our, in our, you know, intro to networking class. We're, we're having them run NMAP. Um, actually, we're having them run Wireshark in that class too. So, you know, we don't want to just talk about network traffic uh, theoretically. We actually want them to be able to see network traffic. So uh, in that first uh, 100 level networking class, intro to networking class, they're installing uh, uh, Wireshark and they're installing NMAP. Well, technically it's ZenMap. Uh, but they're installing that so that they actually um, are seeing network traffic. So Nmap is a wonder, another great tool. Uh, ZenMap is a good one to start with because it provides a little bit of a GUI interface. And uh, you, you see the link right there. Uh, again, this is just open source, so it's just free. Uh, I, what I listed there, I think, was an old, uh, an old assignment that we used to do. Um, we had them build, in one of the classes, we had them build a little work group. So this was part of a networking class. Um, this wasn't specifically cyber, although this is one of the foundational classes to get into the cyber program. Uh, so in this first class, they had to build their own little work group. So they each fired up their VMs, or in actually, what, now that we have the ESXi model, they all log into the ESXi server, and then they build VMs inside there, and then they have to figure out how to create the virtual NICs in each of their VMs that can connect to the virtual switch, which is already in there. And then once they build that all out, then we have them run an NMAP on all the different VMs that are on the network. And so it, 
it, it's it's kind of a project that builds over several weeks um, and they're learning again they're learning virtualization they're learning networking they're learning scanning all of the things they're kind of learning uh, through hands-on so that's kind of how we've we've built this out so just running basic end maps and letting them see what those results are uh, is quite educational um, we get in, into uh, some of our uh, you know cyber classes uh, here's just an example of one of the projects you know, when we get into a little bit of a, the, the cryptographic discussion, we don't spend a lot of time on this because, uh, you know, again, most of these students aren't going to come out of a two-year school and get a job as a, as a crypto analyst. But, but at least to expose them to the potential of what's out there and a career path that's out there, we do spend some time in the fundamentals class with this. And here's an example of just one of the one of the projects that we have them do. This is, I think, a site I just found online. I just went out and googled some some you know cheap uh, cyber things. I think I paid maybe 30 bucks for this, but, um, uh, this, you know, just introduces them to, to, uh, this pig pen cipher, which is, you know, one that a lot of people have heard about. Um, but you know, we make a whole class out of this and, and, and we say, all right, here's, here's an example of one cipher. And then we have each team, uh, create their own cipher and, you know, we encourage them and, 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 and try to incentivize them to be creative, you know, Step outside of your comfort zone and don't just do your basic, uh, you shift the alphabet letters by two kind of a cipher. So we've had some come up with some pretty crazy ones where they get into, uh, you know, the, the even the, the coloring scheme where they, they pick uh, different colors and and each color represents a, 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 a tech, a, you know, a character or something like that. So some of them have actually been very, very creative and come up with some really cool ideas, but they have to create their own cipher and uh then they have to be able to try to you know get messages to to uh, their team members through the cipher and then the other students get a chance to kind of try to break it so anyway that's just one example of what we do uh here's another example again i just found this one on google the, the kids half the time find it on google too so they, they they can kind of find their own answer but but it's okay because it introduces them again to the idea of ciphers and, and the different ways of doing it this particular one has three different ciphers on it the the the, the you know Main one on the on the left uh, is just a um, a binary cipher, so they have to you know they have to go out and find a a, a binary to text uh, uh, translator, which again they can just go Google that, and then they just type in all these all these bits uh, these these binary numbers, and to get the to get the answer, it leads to a URL which is to download the Alice in Wonderland PDF file. And once they download that file, then they then they go over to the top right cipher is a book cipher, which means they got to go to page five, line 15, word six, and then they got to find all those words. And then that comes out and there's a, that's solvable for them. And then the other one is, I want to say it's a hex, uh, uh, I can't remember what cipher that one is. But anyway, just kind of on the, on his, on the back of his neck, there's another cipher. And they figure that out. So, uh, you know, we can spend a whole class period just, Getting them to to solve this uh, to solve this puzzle. Um, anyway, so there's just another example that we have, and um, I guess that's all I have. So um, hopefully, I laid out a pretty good uh, explanation as to what we've done here. Um, I suppose um, Adam, we can open this up to Q and A now, or if yeah, of anybody course. Anybody has any questions? And a couple of reminders, there is a question panel on the GoToWebinar taskbar that loaded on your screen. So enter any questions there. And uh, there will be a very short seven question multiple choice survey at the end with just some, some insights into, into what you thought about the webinar and, and future webinar topics. Um, just to kick it off with some questions, uh, you talked about um, how you prepared students for the uh, level one security analyst as a job. Um, yeah. Tell us about kind of like the core courses that students have to complete, like the networking courses, and then the specialized course that get them all the way through your program. Yeah, so when when I first started here, um, I, I kind of had to build the, the, an, an IT department before I could build a cyber specific program. So when you know my first title here was really department chair for the IT department but I was also the only person in that department so I mean it's a little little misleading but um so I had to build out really an IT 
an IT program first. Um, and so we kind of start with, we kind of established a core set of courses that we, that we needed every technology student to be aware of. Um, we started out with, um, and, and also, by the way, we made it, my, my, one of my early things was to try to do, to, to make it so that I could, I could do some of these online. I, we, we, the college has since kind of backed off of that a little bit. We have a different online strategy now that's done in a different area. So that's not a, a, a primary focus for me now, but initially it was. And so the first thing I wanted to do was, um, you know, uh, make it so that I could teach a course face-to-face -face or online, um, which again, the test out stuff was what made it so useful. So I, I used their, uh, their PC Pro content um, was uh, one of the first classes that I used because that that aligns with the CompTIA A plus, which many of you may already be doing, using and 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 so the PC Pro stuff because it had all the videos and all the labs and everything. Again, I didn't have to uh, to actually teach that one face to face. In fact, I still don't teach that one face to face. That's one of the there's two classes that I don't I don't even have a face to face option for. Um, and and uh, and I use the um, PC Pro is the is the content that I use for that one. But that gives them just a, a you know a, a decent uh, uh, overview of hardware. You know what is a NIC, what is a motherboard, what is a memory card. Um, and you know I don't have any hardware that they can tear apart in class because again all my hardware is donated, so I don't have enough for them to 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 play with in class. So that one is, I just do online, but but that is kind of an important foundational content. They need to understand some of that basic P, uh, hardware stuff. Then I also have them uh, lead next with the uh, Windows client. So my found my my four foundational classes, if I were to identify the four, would be the PC Pro using the PC Pro stuff, uh, a Windows client class, which I use uh, I use test out for as well. But that you know just introduces them to Windows 7, Windows 10. Uh, that's where they start to learn a little bit peer-to-peer -peer stuff. So we do some of the peer-to-peer -peer networking stuff in class for that one. Um, the uh, Windows Server class and the Intro to Networking class. So those are my four, kind of my four foundational classes. I've got, I do also have a, a programming class, but I didn't build that one. I, uh, I, I once I once I was able to hire on a, a, a full-time faculty to to kind of take over the the CS stuff um, I just told him I wanted him to build me a a scripting class you know using uh, preferably using Python and he, he's built one using Python and JavaScript and so so I just kind of use one of his classes so I can't take credit for that but but um, you know that's not that's not mission critical for for me I like it because most cyber professionals do need to know how to script and, and write some code um, and so um, I have built that into, but initially I did not have that. Initially, I just started with those four that I was talking about, the, just you know, the hardware, the Windows desktop, the Windows server, and the, uh, the networking class. I, that, was, that was where I started. Then later on, I, 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 I wanted them to, to also have Linux. And so I've made that as an elective and stuff like that. But um, that's, that, those are my foundation. Those are my 100 level classes. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. And then uh, what classes do you have as, as the advanced options? I know you mentioned ethical hacker. Yeah. So when we get into the advanced stuff, those are my 200 level classes. Uh, my first 200 level class is the cybersecurity fundamentals. Um, so once they've done all the 100 level classes, then they, you know, in fact, I make, I've, I've made the, I've made Windows Server a prereq to the fundamentals in cyber because they need to know Active Directory and they need to know GPOs and that kind of stuff before they get into the cyber the, the cyber class. So my my intro to cyber uh, class is uh, is a 200 level class. Uh, we do use the the uh, Security Pro content for that, um, but that's where we start really using Kali. So I introduce Kali in that course. And a lot of what we're doing in our face-to-face -face classes is just playing in Kali and in, in you know virtual machines. And uh, you know we it does give us a chance to go back and review all their networking stuff because they have to, you know, they got to network their their network and they got to make sure they they're all on the same subnet and they've got to make sure they're all 
you know, configuring their their machines on the same uh, to the right to the right subnet. So um, that's where I introduced that. Um, I have had a pen testing class. Uh, I, I did have to hire an adjunct to build that one for me, um, and we were using the um, um, the e, was it the EC EC Council? I think there you know the the uh, the uh, ethical hacker uh, certification that they use. Um, once test out told me that they were building a, a, a test out equivalent of that, of course, I, I was very excited because it, it plugs right into what I've already been doing. So I, I did, I, I have beginning this semester, that's where I'm going to be plugging in that content. I do also still have uh, a risk analysis course and an incident response course. Those are courses that I have built on my own. Um, we have uh, we've built some close relationships. There's a couple of local companies here in town that we have built some really good partnerships with. Again, I'm a small school. I don't need 300 business partners to partner with. I need like two. So I went and just found we have a we have there's a business here in town that runs a kind of a sock as a service business. And so I kind of talked my way into meeting with them and. Um, have since built a really good relationship with them to where they now invite us over to sit in their sock throughout the semester. I'll take the kids over there. We'll actually ha hold class over there uh, three or four times throughout the semester. And so they, so the kids get experience sitting in a sock and you know experiencing what it's like to be in there. I am in the process of building out my own sock here on campus. So now that I've got my little infrastructure. Uh, running all this virtual in, environment, I kind of again took over, again kind of uh, doing it before anybody knew I was doing it. Uh, I, I've taken over a little uh, a little conference room that we had here in our little area, and it's becoming our sock. I've got a couple of monitor, big screen monitors that have been donated, um, and uh, been able to you know get some tables and some chairs in there. And so this semester is the is when I'm planning to really actually. I want to bring on some interns, my own student interns. I can't, I'm not going to be able to afford them. I don't have budget to hire any more students. So I'm offering it simply as a one credit hour course uh, credit, uh, but I, but it also will provide me a chance to kind of build my own internal internship in a SOC. So ideally, I would like my students to go work over this partner business in their SOC. Um, and they have hired actually they probably hired over the last year, I think six or seven of my students over there now. So I'll, already I've got students, even before they're graduated, who are now working over in that SOC as security analysts, level one security analysts. So that partnership has been huge for me, but they're not going to hire all my students. And I've got some students who you know, may or may not be able to find a, an internship on their own. So this gives me a chance to to kind of hire their them unpaid to work in my and my sock here. So that's that's the next big thing I'm trying to build out that um, I'm hoping for uh, this next semester. So I've been, um, so I'm really excited to see if I can get that working. Um, I also have just a basic cyber lab class, and that one really is just a lab. I mean, we we meet once a week on a Friday morning for three hours. It's a three credit hour class, and uh, there's no books to read. There's no videos to watch. There's no lecture to give. Uh, we do have a lot of discussions, and I, so I do I do lead a lot of discussions on different things. But basically, it's kind of our a, cum, a, a cum, cumulate, cumulative class, a culmination class, where I say, okay, now we're all going to build out our own environment. And so this is where, you know, we talk a lot about firewalls. We talk a lot about IDS systems. We talk a lot about you know, SIM systems that that are used inside of a SOC, uh, but a lot of that is theoretical discussions, and they don't, we haven't had, you know, they haven't been able to go real deep into those, and so this lab class is really where they're just building me a, a, an IT environment. I break them up into into teams of three or four, well, actually two or three. I prefer smaller groups, so I break them up into teams of two or three. Um, I've dedicated one. Uh, one ESXi box to this group. We we beefed it up with RAM. I I do have I do have enough money to buy some RAM cards, so I've been able to add some more RAM to some of these donated machines. 
So I've got a I've got a couple of ESXi boxes or, or, or Dell servers that are I've really I've really beefed out with a lot of RAM, um, and so each team has to build their own firewall, and they have to build a they have to build two two virtual NICs on that firewall, and we just use PFSense because it's it's free, right? It's open source, so they just build a, a PFSense firewall. And then they have to their external uh, their external interface. They have to connect to the ESXi switch that was you know the the, the default the ESXi virtual switch that's there. So that they all all the firewalls have to be able to see each other, and they have to prove to me that they can ping each other and see the other firewalls. And then each team has to build on the internal interface of the fi of that uh, firewall. Uh, they build out an IDS system. They build out an Active Directory domain system. So we basically spend the entire semester just building out a network. And the objectives, you know, mo most of the assessments that are do that I'm doing in that class are pretty binary. They they either did it or they didn't. I'm not. There's not like a ma you know any major rubric where I'm grading them on certain things. It's like did you build did you build your firewall? Yes. Does it work? Yes. Uh, you know, can you have you set 10 different rules in your firewall? Yes, right? And, you know, it's, it's pretty just either they did it or they didn't. Um, and then the same with the IDS system. We use Alien Vault as IDS uh, just because it's free. And uh, then they have to they have to build up, they have to bring up a Windows domain controller. They have to bring up a secondary domain controller uh, added to that domain. So that, again, kind of reiterates their whole server focus in their IT side. They have to then install a HIDS uh, host IDS on each of those two boxes that then can report up into Alien Vault. So you can see, I mean, we push these kids, we set the bar pretty high here, but because we're not really grading them harshly and on silly, you know, administrative type projects, they either did it or they didn't. And um, and so it, it, it's pretty easy to grade, but it gives them a chance to just play. So kind of a long answer, but hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Great. Um, and then we have some setup questions. Uh, I know the length of your program is two years, um, mm -hmm. but uh, a couple of the setup questions is, do you have kind of your minimum requirements for the hardware? And how do you manage things like Microsoft Server and Windows licenses? Uh, very good. So um, we, I, I told you initially we did not want to require laptops for our students. Um, primarily because um, I didn't have the bandwidth to go and find some great educational deal for the college. Um, and with all my international students, I was a little hesitant to require that. Um, the college has now, and again, part of this, I think, is just became out of the, the fact that we are, we are starting to have success. The college now has built some, some relationships with local vendors, and, and we do now require laptops for the students that doesn't necessarily mean that they all the laptops are working so i don't want to set a false expectation here because a lot of the students are you know they're they're gifted old laptops that still don't work but uh but at least we now have that and and so if your question is the minimum specs for that um we do have a minimum spec for that and off the top of my head i'm trying to remember i want to say it's at least 12 gig of ram and at least an i7 processor uh, we don't like, I don't like the AMD processors. We've had problems with them. So I like the Intel, uh, the i5 is not enough power. So, uh, a, a, an i7 or higher, uh, Pentium or not, or, or yeah, the, the, you know, the i7, uh, multiprocessor chip, uh, is our minimum requirement on the, on the hardware for the laptop. As far as the servers go in the back office, we'll take whatever we can get. So, um, like I said, we found a, a, a couple of large companies here in town who, you know, uh, as I've made contact to some of their IT people, and I've said, look, when, you're, you know, when your current hardware comes off of depreciation schedules and off of your books, and you're just going to throw them out anyway, just think of us. And so I've had several of them reach out saying, hey, I've got three big Dell boxes that we're going to get rid of if you want them. Um, I've got these, you know, I've got a, a couple of Cisco routers if you want them. Uh, and so that's how I've gotten all my hardware. So we'll get what we can get. A lot of the servers, I have been able to scrape enough money to add RAM to it. Um, most of them have come with enough storage, 
but most of them have not come with enough RAM. So I have had to go out again. I just go out of Amazon. Amazon is my new best friend. So um, I just get uh, some memory and stuff off of Amazon. And so we beef up our machines. But this also gives my students again, because my students are doing all this. I, I haven't opened up or added one RAM card into a machine. I've, I've hired uh, about uh, six of my students over the years. Right now, I, I've, I've been able to scale my team up to six. So I've got six students in there. I don't pay them great, but I, I, I do I do try to pay them. Um, and uh, and so this gives them an excuse now to, you know, when if they need to buy something, they have to send the link and request to me, and then I decide whether or not I can afford it and whether or not I can get it. But um, so that, that's that's kind of how how we do that. Do these donated far, machines come with the licenses already installed? Uh, the desktops have all come with a Windows uh, license, in, uh, yes, as, as part of that. So, so, but uh, but even if they didn't, I do go out to Microsoft has their educational program. It used to be run through Cavuto. Now they're running it through their Azure system. Um, and um, I have been paying in the past. I have uh, been able to get approved a budget to pay a departmental license for that. This past year, uh, again, the, the my executive team finally discovered what I was doing down here. And they said, oh, that's cool that you're getting all that software you know, at, at the discount. Do they have a school-wide license? And I said, yeah, but you're gonna have to pay for it because I can't afford that one. So now the school has taken over that, paying for that license. Um, and they're now, so so they, they now buy that through, again, Microsoft used to run it through the Cavuto group but now they now they're running it themselves i think just through their azure site so so that's how we're getting that now so we get like office 365 through them now um and all of the windows licenses that you know windows server uh, uh, uh i have a we have a database class using sql server microsoft sql server so all the students can get that through that for so the school does pay the license now for that and uh and the students can just download what they need. And so all the virtual machines, they can they can pretty much get what they want. Um, a lot of the other software the outside of the Microsoft, so so we pay for, all, the only things that, that we have been paying for, uh, I still pay the VMware license through my department because the school won't take that one over, but uh, so, uh, so I pay for an annual VMware license, but that means all my students can use it. And then the school is now paying for the Microsoft licenses, but all my students can use that now too. Everything else they get, we're just using open source. Awesome. And then one final request from you would just be if you could, uh, we'd, we'd love to send these slides out to everyone who's on here. And okay. there's been a request just if you could map out the, uh, the layout of the classes that you offer um, through your program, how that kind of looks as a sample. And so that we can send that out after. You mean like the like 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 just the just the catalog list of the courses that are part of my program? Yep. Or yeah, like sort of how we walked through the core classes, the 100 level and the 200, what the offerings are, what's required, what's elective, and, and oh, just okay. kind of a snapshot of how you've you've organized your program. I'll add a, I'll add one more slide to the end that will kind of have a snapshot of that. Great. And uh, so that's about all the time we had. If you have any additional questions, please. Feel free to send them to me. My email is a keys, the letter A K E Y S at testout.com. Be happy to answer any of that. And in just a second, when we wrap up, uh, there will be a little survey, just seven multiple choice questions that pops up on your screen, a couple short answers. And uh, we're very grateful, Spencer, for your time. Um, I've had some feedback come back on the questions pa page saying, thank you very much. This was very informative, very helpful. So we're we're very grateful for all of the work that you've put into this. And uh, for all those that are in attendance, we will send out the recording and the slides um, once we have that compiled and, and published. So look out for that in your email. And again, Spencer, thank you very much. And, and that concludes our webinar for today. Thanks, Adam. Bye, all. Bye-bye.